This year, you may have noticed that Rosh Hashanah fell on Shabbat. Traditionally speaking, shofar is not sounded on Shabbat. The mystery is going to be answered. Which is why, or one of the reasons why, Rosh Hashanah is a two-day festival, even in Israel. With two days, the shofar will be sounded on at least one of the two. My inclination was not to have shofar in our service this year, but instead to gather the next day in the park and have a little shofar service then, which we did. However, as news of my decision spread through the Torah of Awakening <laughs> service leader world, I heard that someone from our team was not happy. I called Estelle and I made my case. I told her that I want this Rosh Hashanah falling on Shabbat to feel different by adding some special Shabbat songs and prayers and making room for them by not having shofar. Haha, <laughs> making room for them. She expressed that shofar is the most important part of Rosh Hashanah and that many won't hear it at all if we don't do it on the first day. Plus, she said, what's the problem since you have musical instruments anyway? Kol machloket shehi l'shem shemayim sofa lehit kayem. Every machloket, every dispute that is for the sake of heaven will endure in the end. V'she'einu l'shem shemayim, but if it's a dispute that's not for the sake of heaven, ein sofa lehit kayem. It will not endure in the end. This was a perfect example of a machloket l'shem shemayim, an argument for the sake of heaven. But this machloket was unlike many of the halachic disputes of the rabbis in which there are clear winners and losers. For example, the argument between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai in which Beit Shammai said we should light all eight candles on the first night of Hanukkah and then one less for each of the eight days. And Beit Hillel said that we should light one candle on the first night, two on the second, and so on. Hillel's became the common practice, not Shammai's. Although nowadays some people do both. But in this case, we compromised. We left shofar out of Musaf so that, we could, so that the davening would feel different for Shabbat, but we brought it back at the end, and anyone who wanted to hear shofar could hear, and anyone who wanted to step out could do so. I felt good about our compromise, not just because it's good in general to work out our disagreements, but because it points to a deeper level of the halachic process, the process by which Jewish practices are worked out. After all, what is the point of Jewish spiritual practice? The ordinary understanding is that God gave the Jewish people Torah and mitzvot, teaching and commandments, and that those are the means by which we can connect with the divine and fulfill our purpose. The non-religious secular scholar view, on the other hand, denies the idea of a divinely given Torah and mitzvot and sees Judaism, as well as all other religions, as essentially human creations. But this dualism of divinely given versus human creation is, in my view, born from an insensitivity to the miracle of the ordinary. Far more extraordinary than the idea of divine revelation with miracles and pillars of fire is the simple miracle of two beings I'm trying not to get verklempt, but I'm getting verklempt. <laughs> the simple miracle of two beings having a conversation and resolving a conflict. On a deeper level, more extraordinary than any holy book is the very fact of our own beingness, our own, our own awareness of our beingness, our consciousness as outposts of the divine mind manifesting right now in these bodies that we inhabit. The duality then is not human creation versus divine revelation. 
It is either being sensitive to the mystery of consciousness as a divine miracle or being insensitive, conditioned, and unimpressed. In truth, Torah is happening constantly as the arising of thought within this mir miraculous field of consciousness that we are. You might disagree saying that much of what arises in consciousness is not particularly wise or interesting at all. And it's true. As I say these words that have arisen within the consciousness that I am, there is perhaps some sense of the sacred. But if Bugs Bunny appears in my mind, I dismiss it rather than saying it, even though I just said it. <laughs> Bugs Bunny is not bad, but it doesn't necessarily point to something sacred or divine. But the process of Torah actually includes this process of discernment between wisdom and Bugs Bunny. Arba midot beyoshvim lifnei chachamim. There are four types who sit before the sages. This is also Perkei Avot. A sfog, a sponge. Umashpech, uh, a funnel, Mishameret, a strainer, and a nafa, a sieve. These four types are like different ways that we can relate to religion or tradition or the teaching. A sponge just soaks everything up. Whatever, whatever it's told to them, they just repeat it and believe it. A funnel. Whatever they learn just goes in one end and out the other. They just forget it all. The opposite of the sponge. The strainer, which lets out the wine and retains the lease, is the worst kind of religious person. That's someone who all, they, all that religion does is make them judgmental to other people. It doesn't help them be a better person at all. But a sieve, which lets out the coarse meal and retains the choice flour, is the person who can sift through it and discover what's helpful and what has to be discarded. Or at least set aside for now. This remarkable passage in Pirkei Avot, this is not a modern thing. This is like 2,000 years old. It contradicts the traditional idea of the Torah as eternally perfect and whole, which we might see reflected in this passage in which God says, et kol hadavar asher nochim et sava etchem oto, all this matter which I command you, tishmuru la'asot, you shall guard to do. Lo tosef alav, you shall not add to it, velo tigra mimenu, and you shall not take away from it. The Pirkei Avot passage seems to be saying that it's up to us to discern which parts of the teaching are good and which parts should be dismissed, while the Torah verse seems to be saying that the Torah is perfect as it was given and we shouldn't add or subtract to it from it. So how do we resolve these two verses? The answer, I believe, is hinted in Asher Enochi Metzave Etchem, that I command you. The you, meaning we, are part of the process. In other words, our own discernment is the means by which we are commanded. We must discern what is truly important, first for ourselves, so that we may know what our own values are, and then in dialogue with others, so that we can be in harmony with their values and find a path that serves to the best of our ability. Once we've found that, then we must not add or subtract from it. Meaning, we must not insist that our way is the only right way, that would be adding, nor must we be deny our own values when we confront the strong opinions of others. <laughs> that would be subtracting. Instead, tishmeru la'asot, you shall be attentive to do it. Do the path as you discern is the proper way in dialogue. But of course, we can only do this if we purify ourselves to know our own depths and to be clean in our relationships with others. This is the meaning of kapara on this day of atonement. Kippur, Yom Kippur, kapara means making up for something, correcting a wrong, making whole and unifying that which was broken or fragmented. In this sense, 
the English play and the word that Rabbi Saraleah brought a little earlier, in which atonement becomes at one mint is appropriate. Because how do we make it one mint? We do it by giving something up, by compromising, by being willing to feel the slight sting of not getting our way completely in order to avoid the far worse sting of broken relationship. That willingness to feel the slight sting is the kapara, like the goat sacrifices of the ancient Yom Kippur rite, it substitutes for the brokenness and heals. Interestingly, another way of saying substitute is mimale makom, which literally means filling the space. We avoid filling the vacuum created by our misdeeds with disaster by filling it with something else, filling it with dialogue, compromise, and other healers of relationships, such as apologies. On the deepest level, our kapara sacrifice is something we can practice any moment when we recognize that our minds tend to fill up the space with thought. Sometimes that thought is just Bugs Bunny. Sometimes it is the channeling of Torah. But if we are to be the student that retains the choice flower, we must practice being aware of our own minds filling the space, not always with thinking, 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 but with presence, with awareness. Then we can experience, experience mimale makom, that the whole world is filled with the radiant mystery of being that we call the divine. 